Hi guys and welcome back to my channel and if you are new then a big huge welcome to you. I hope you guys are doing really really well and um, this uh, I don't know if this video is going to go up earlier or on the same day as Friday but I thought that I would do something completely different today because I've realised that I haven't done a review video in such a long time. Well, and react and a review video. And I did do lots of ones on my YouTube channel, but unfortunately I had to privatise them all. But I thought I would do something completely different because there is a video that I've been really obsessed with watching lately. And it has something to do with one of the hobbies I love, which is history. So about nearly a year ago, during the first lockdown there was a YouTube channel called Oh Simplified where it did a video on Henry VIII and <laughs> being the person that I am who loves history I am a massive fan of the Tudors. The Tudor period is my favourite part of English history. If not English then British. And when I'm not watching vlogs or listening to music I would watch history videos or documentaries that are online and I thought to myself that since I love it so much and since I've watched it for almost a year I thought I would do a review and a sit down and talk about it once again and I won't go into too much detail because I know that I've explained enough already but this video is going to be a little bit longer so I would highly recommend getting a drink or a snack and also another heads up I'm going to be talking over most of the videos and there will be a time where I have to stop and pause because being a history nerd I do so many things and there are points that I want to point out but we're just going to have to see how we go. I may not talk over it much because I know some stuff already and it won't need over talking but we're just going to have to see how we go. But before I start the review video I want to know and in the comment section down below if you are a history fan like me two questions actually not one which is your favorite historical period and why and also if you are a fan of the Tudors who is your favorite wife out of the six wives and again let me know in the comment section down below and let's get talking about it and I would really love to hear what's your favorite period and who's your favorite wife because I know we're gonna have a very long conversation about it in the comments but yes I'm really really excited to do this so I I won't go into too much detail, so let's go, let's do this. I just realised that I have been talking over the intro for about four minutes, which is something that I usually do, but I think by the time I edit it down, it's just going to be something different. <laughs> I realised that I've been talking uh, so much about the intro and then just blabbering on about for about five minutes, but it's going to be like a little bit longer by the time it, the video goes up. But yeah, anyway, let's do this. Three, two, one, let's do this. This video was made possible by Honey. Keep watching to find out how you can save money when you shop online. Also, the reviews are in. Really. That's some nice merch. Get your brand new character pin, limited time. It's cool, face but I won't wear Link Get them actually. Blah. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Tell me, was I a good king? Uh, you were okay. Will I be remembered as the great warrior king who invaded France, revolutionized English healthcare, and developed great parklands? No. Um, probably not, because of the. Wife killings. Because of the wife, wife killings. Blah. Blah. <laughs> Sigmund, how did I get here? I still remember the good old days when I was a boy with a heart full of fire. And mummy would teach me. Okay, him. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop there. So, when I was watching it originally, I've noticed that in part of the flashback, there were so many toys that were modern, but very inaccurate because you've got Power Rangers, you've got skateboards and scooters and hover bikes. <laughs> I, I know they're just like small Easter eggs, but they are really inaccurate. <laughs> And that's what's made me really giggle about it. But it's nice to have a few Easter eggs in there. But I don't actually know what Tudor toys were actually like. But I have to do a few researches on that because I know that'll be very interesting. But let, let's go and we continue with the flashback. Hey, Henry. This is a horse. Can you say horse? Ho, ho, divorce. <laughs> what? No. Okay, let's try this one. 
Can you say loaf of bread? L loaf with the <laughs> Henry, that's wrong. You know what? Last one. Okay. Can you say soap? Soap. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> I'm the supreme head of the church. Screw the Pope. You know what? You're my son and I love you. But, but you're, you're freaking, freaking weird. weird. <laughs> the year is 1491. England has just come out of three decades of civil war in which a bunch of Henrys, Edwards, and one Richard had a little ding-dong over which royal house should rule the realm. Mm -hmm. Finally, a Henry I, Henry VII, and he had a son. What should we name him? My royal lineage is full of Henrys. A fine name. A vigorous name. A tenacious name. A muscular name. How about Arthur? And so Arthur, <laughs> Prince of Wales, and next in line to the throne, was born. Five years later, Prince Henry was born, but nobody cares about him. He's not the heir, just a spare. The king wanted to make an alliance with Spain, so one day he said to his son Arthur, Hey, baby, you see that lady baby? That's going to be your wife. But father, I'm not even three years old yet. Listen, there's something you have to understand. You're my son. But more than that, you're a political bargaining tool. <laughs> but you love me, right? I love you as a political bargaining tool. Yay. <laughs> I feel so sorry for Arthur in this one, but um, yes, it's actually true. Um, in marriages, it, they weren't just about for love in those times, it was just for political alliances, though there were marriages that, through these political alliances, that developed into love, but mostly it was just for politics, but it's not just in the Tudors, but basically it was through everywhere really well everywhere until like the modern day <laughs> but um yeah apparently Arthur and Catherine did love each other from what I understand but so did Henry and Catherine but there was a very important reason behind all of this well for the two marriages for Catherine because it developed into something that is continued to this day but I will carry on with this but yeah hey pop who the heck are you? I've written you a poem. Listen here, tiny man. Can't you see that I'm busy? But I'm your son. I have another son? As Arthur was in another palace, being prepped to become king, Henry lived with his mother and two sisters at Eltham, where he was being trained for a church career. And not just that, Henry learnt languages. He played sports. He learnt the recorder. What a nerd. Am I right? Wrong. Henry was the coolest kid around. So I told my Latin teacher he could kiss yes my buddyus. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't get it, but it's a cheater thing. Great scholars and theologians from across Europe came to meet and teach the young Prince Henry, who by all accounts was a very enlightened, bright and charming young boy. Everybody loved Henry. And out of everything Henry was taught, more than anything, he came to adore and respect theology and Catholicism. One of Henry's tutors... Yeah, that's true, actually. Henry really loved Catholicism. He adored Roman Catholicism and he would do anything to defend for it, he would do anything to protect it and he would just basically do anything and it's quite different from what you really see because it's not really mentioned a lot but when I first heard about it it was completely surprising because I know that religion can mean so, so much to people, but with Henry you can actually see why he loves supporting the Catholic Church. One of Henry's tutors was English poet laureate John Skelton, who wrote a textbook for Henry that we still have today. In it, he wrote a number of important lessons for the young prince, such as, do not be mean, loathe gluttony, and do not violate widows. Important lessons for any nine-year-old boy. Around this time, Henry's older brother Arthur, now 15 years old, was married to Catherine of Aragon, sealing the union between England and Spain. And then he died. Ooh. Oh, my alliance with Spain. My poor, poor alliance with Spain. And your son, sire? Oh, yes, of course, my son. But mostly my <laughs> alliance with Spain. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? Oh, yeah! And just like that, an unprepared Prince Henry was now the new heir to the throne. And how about that alliance with Spain? Well, the solution was simple. Hey, boy, see that full-grown woman over there? That's gonna be your wife. What, my brother's widow? Yes. You're a freaking weirdo, man. <laughs> now, in the Bible, there's a verse that says marrying your brother's widow, that's a big no-no. Mm -hmm. So the king needed to convince the Pope and get his special permission. Hey, can I please have my son marry his brother's widow? Eh, sure, why not? <laughs> and so it was. Henry's life was turned on its head as he was moved to the royal court, next in line to the throne. But tragedy struck when just a few months later, 
His mother, with whom he was very close, suddenly died in childbirth. The loss of his mother almost certainly had a big effect on the young boy. Well, I'll stop right there because actually, this is not just his close relationship with his mum, but Henry, he was a little bit of a ladies man because he always seems to get along with women a lot more than men. He does get along with men and he did during his lifetime, but because of his upbringing with his mum and his sisters, Henry developed like a really good relationship with women and that's basically his strengths because he could get along with women so easily but then it also turns into his weakness and that's the main reason why that some women actually fell out with him because they could socialise him with him easily and then if he's had enough with them or if something happens then they could fall out of favour quite quickly. In his older years, King Henry VII went on a bit of a paranoid trip. As was normal for a king at the time, Henry VII had had to quell a number of rebellions, and as he aged, he became ever more suspicious of the nobility around him. To keep them in check, he began levying huge, ruinous fines, left, right, and center. Dukes, bishops, barons, even his own mother. No one was safe from his tyranny, and the nobility of England began to suffer. So when Henry VII finally got sick and died just after Christmas 1508, there was a lot of celebration. Not only because the tyrannical Henry VII was gone, but because his replacement was the ever-popular, charming, and handsome 18-year-old King Henry Yay! VIII. Henry married Catherine of Aragon in June 1509. You may be wondering, if it's so weird to marry your brother's widow, and since he's now king, couldn't Henry just decide not to? Well, yes, he could. But by now, Henry wanted to. The thing about Henry that was unlike many kings of the time was he married for love. And he'd grown so, quite yeah. fond of Catherine. Very fond. Historians say their marriage was unusually good. And so he was coronated king. And what a king. Compared to his tyrannical father, he was an absolute joy. Having the blood of two royal houses, he was widely supported. He was really, really ridiculously good looking. And those famous calves could achieve world peace. Hey Henry. Now that you're king, you know what that means. Costume party! Henry danced around the palace playing dress up with his friends. He wrote plays. He sang songs. He danced. A true renaissance true. man. Very different from the gluttonous wife killer we think of today. In his early reign, people from near and far would come to ask favors of the generous king. Hey man, could I gain ownership of some land near Upton Snodsbury? Sure thing, pal. <laughs> hey, could I be an earl or a baron or a viscount or something? Anything you want, man. Could I get, like, just, like, a really cool pig that has, like, freaking metal wings and eight <laughs> legs and shoots flipping lasers and if you grow more pigs out of it for extra pigs, say no more. Hey, guys, I was just checking up on the financial report and what the hell? We can't afford this. Henry's council that he inherited from his father weren't happy with all the money he was just throwing around, and they worked hard to curb the king's spending. Since they controlled the royal seals needed to get stuff done, at first they were largely able to control the young king. And for Henry, the most infuriating things of all was they wouldn't let him jest with his friends because it was too dangerous, nor would they let him do the thing he wanted most, to go on a great, glorious, and expensive conquest against England's historic enemy, France. Please guys, I'll keep it cheap. How? I'm glad you asked. I've got a promo code. I'll skip the advert the actually. <laughs> um here we go. Uh Continue on after the adverts. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, sexy calves, excessive spending, and war with France. Henry wanted glory. He wanted to go down in history. If he didn't go to war in France, was he even the king of England? Man, I want to go to war so bad, but the council won't let me. Hey, maybe I can help with that. Whoa, it's Cardinal Wolsey. One of my best friends, despite being an old ass man, Cardinal Wolsey knew that if he helped King Henry, there'd likely be something in it for him. So what was his great, intricate plan to curb the council's power? You're the king, dum-dum. You can do whatever you want. What? <laughs> oh? 
Wolsey began writing bills that simply didn't require the seals, and thus, Henry was back on top. Oh, Through yeah. his efforts, Wolsey began to climb the ranks, and he became something of a yes-man for King Henry, encouraging Henry to frolic and play while Wolsey took care of business. <laughs> hey, kid, you want to go on an adventure? Do I ever! <laughs> the Pope was at war with France, and he needed some help. He offered the young, impressionable King Henry 100 Parmesan cheeses, some wine, and a golden rose if he came to the Pope's aid, and Henry was all in. At this point in his life, he still respected the church and loved the Pope, and here was the chance for war he had been waiting for. He still didn't have an heir, a fairly big problem for a monarch at the time, but right now, the only kind of smashing he was interested in was smashing French guys in the face. And so off he went. The English already held the French city of Calais. From there, Henry made a glorious victory at the Battle of the Spurs. He took the French cities of Terouanne and Tournai. Word of his victory spread. This was it. Here was the glory he had been waiting for. Back home, his beautiful wife also led armies to victory in Scotland. And better yet, she was pregnant. Soon, Henry would- Apparently, and you might see it in the second season of The Spanish Princess, which I haven't watched by the way, but I keep meaning to. In real life, Catherine actually went to war up to Scotland to protect England while she was pregnant, and apparently she wore armour as well. And I don't know if it's true or not, but it, it's so cool that she did that. But Catherine was a very, very tough cookie. Basically, she's the warrior queen. And I can see why why she was really loved because she was clever, she was witty, she was even the first female Spanish ambassador before she married Henry. And she she really was one of the greatest English queens, I I think, really. So Henry was pretty lucky, really, until he had enough of her, really. But we'll get to that now. <laughs> Henry would have an heir. All of Henry's wildest dreams were coming true. Oh, he ran out of money. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he prepared to invade Italy. All Henry could do was go home. Well, at least now I have an heir to cheer me up. Bring me my son. Henry, this is Mary. Mary? That's a funny name for a boy. Henry, it's a girl. <laughs> this was Catherine's fifth pregnancy that had not resulted in a male heir. Happy Henry wasn't so happy anymore. You still haven't given me a male heir. Well, how do you know it's my problem? Maybe it's your problem, Henry. It couldn't be my problem because I've been boinking half your maid staff and one of them gave me a boy, uh... True. I mean, sure. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it's my problem. I'll look into that. Cardinal Wolsey, <laughs> now Henry's Lord Chancellor, knew his job depended on keeping Henry happy. And so he said, well, if you can't be the great warrior, then how about the great peacemaker? Not as cool, but okay. And so the field of the cloth of gold, a glamorous peace summit between England and France was held. The King of France, Francis I, was essentially the French version of King Henry. And the whole thing was basically one giant codpiece measuring contest. The two sides did agree to a peace treaty. However, it didn't last long. You see, there was a third major player in European politics at the time, an exquisite specimen of royal inbreeding, an heir to a huge inheritance, and a chin that could hit a home run. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. He was Henry's wife's nephew. Henry had helped him out in the past to put down a Spanish rebellion, and now the two wanted to make an alliance, and so a marriage was arranged. Mary, I'd like to introduce you to your 22-year-old fully grown adult cousin, and now your future husband. Ew, he looks inbred. Mary! We're all inbred. With their new alliance, Charles and Henry agreed to team up and relaunch a campaign against France. In 1522, the English landed and stormed as far south as Agincourt, but Charles didn't commit significant forces. Whoops, sorry man, not sure what happened. I'll join in next year. The next year, England's- Oh, I will have to pause there quite quickly because when I watched this video for the first time, I didn't really actually know that existed and I had to keep going over it several times so I can actually process it in my brain. And I thought, well, that alliance was pretty, pretty tough, but I really didn't know that, uh, that they wanted to do something like that. But apparently from what I saw, it was Henry's big idea because you know Henry, he was a very big fan of war. but. It was really quite interesting that Henry was so obsessed in conquering France based on his hero, Henry V. It, it's really easy to see that he wants to become the very big powerful king and he wants to work with people to make sure his dream comes true. But that came with a heavy cost to it really. So Henry, that wasn't really a good idea, even though I've explained it over 500 years later. Sweat Northern France, almost taking Paris, but once again, where was Charles? Oh man, I'm so sorry. I promise, next year, 
I'll be there. The next year came, and a fed up Henry decided he was gonna sit this one out. And just as Charles ravaged the French at the Battle of Pavia and captured the French king. Holy crap, dude. Yeah, I totally kicked France's butt. That's great. So, can I have the French throne like we agreed? Hmm. No. What? Okay. And also, I don't want to marry your ugly daughter anymore. It's ugly? Have you seen your chin? Mummy says it's a strong chin for a strong boy. As Henry's alliance with Charles <laughs> fell apart, Henry knew his days as a warrior were over. This was a problem for Henry, but it was a bigger problem for his wife. Catherine of Aragon had two jobs. The first was to give Henry a male heir, but the second was to maintain an alliance with her relatives. Uh, I have to pause this again. With all queen consorts in England, she had to have two jobs, while a king had to have so many jobs to actually protect his country, to attain alliances, and just to create peace. And the problem is that if monarchs are in big trouble and they don't do any of this, then they are actually given the squashed boot. And I know I'm not making any sense, but what I really mean is there's a likely chance that they're doomed. And Henry didn't basically wanted to do that. He wanted to have his own way. And he wanted to make sure that his country was very financially secure and he would have a son. And he wanted to control so many stuff because he was obsessed with power and he was obsessed obsessed with having things that would continue after his death and that would lead to a very important woman who played a very important role in the next stage of his reign which is none other than Anne Boleyn. In Spain, including her nephew, she had failed and Henry's sexy eyes began to wander. Home from all his wars, Henry ate up his daily 5,000 calories of meat as an infatuation began to grow for one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Beautiful, intelligent, cultured. She was exactly Henry's type. Now, Henry had had dozens of mistresses, including Anne's sister, but Anne didn't want to just be Henry's side chick. She wanted to be his queen. Hen oh, after Scott Paul's there, imagine if your future husband slept with your sister and then you get married to him. Ew, that is so gross. And even though Anne Boleyn did get executed because one of her treasonous acts was incest, you have to really think that Henry did commit incest, but he got away with it, which is oh, a little bit confusing, but that's just downright disgusting. So, yeah. Henry sent dozens of letters, thirsty love poems. In one, he proclaimed that he would like to kiss her pretty duckies. Henry's loins were on fire. But Anne kept him at just the right distance to drive him crazy and push him to find a way to get rid of his current wife. Wolsey, I want a divorce. And as the representative of the Pope here in England, I expect you to sort it out quickly and quietly. I don't want this to turn into a Europe-wide scandal. You got it, your majesty. Hey, Big Papa! My boy Henry says he wants to divorce <laughs> <laughs> to Henry's shock and horror, Wolsey deferred the case back to the Pope in Rome. To make matters worse, after all the wars in Europe, the Pope was currently under the thumb of Charles V. Now everybody knew what was going on, and Henry's divorce trial had become a pawn of greater European politics. For Wolsey, the decision was a disaster. His job was to keep Henry happy, and Henry was very, very unhappy. Oh yeah. Nevertheless, the divorce trial began. Henry's case rested upon the Bible verse in Leviticus that claimed marrying your brother's widow would lead to childlessness, and Henry was certainly having a hard time getting a male heir. He argued that the Pope had got it wrong when he allowed Henry to marry his brother's widow, and that now divorce was the only solution. However, the Pope and Charles V acquired some interesting letters from an unknown source. He wants to kiss her pretty duckies? Man, this is a fire. fire! The Pope now knew the case for divorce may not actually be found in Henry's Bible, but in Henry's pants. After escaping Charles V, the Pope did send out one Cardinal Campaggio to oversee the trial. Campaggio was an old man racked with gout. It took him six painful months to travel from Rome to England, and when he finally got there, this kept happening. Hey, I need you to take a look at this evidence. Can't. I can't. My gout is my acting, gout up. Is acting up. Hey, are you ready to take my testimony? I can't. I can't. My gout is my acting, gout up. Is acting up. Hey, can you please make a decision? Can't. I can't. Your gout is my gout is up. acting up. Anne Boleyn, with her Protestant views in support of the Reformation, suspected the Pope was just delaying. For two whole years, the trial dragged on and on, and in the end, the Pope simply said, "No, no divorce for you." 
Henry, the king that had previously defended the Pope militarily from France and intellectually from the reformist ideas of Martin Luther, mm -hmm. who had once respected the Pope above all, now found the Pope standing between him and fourth base. Fourth Your base being on. What will you do? I'm the king, dum dum. I can do whatever I want. What? what? For his failure, Henry removed Wolsey from the court, a decision that was likely influenced by Anne Boleyn, who disliked the cardinal, having fallen from grace and with potential charges. Well, apparently, also, Catherine of Aragon didn't like Cardinal Wolsey either. So, Cardinal Wolsey wasn't much of a fan with the ladies, really, but with the men, absolutely. Of treason over his head, Wolsey died of illness a year later. Then, Henry set about removing England from the influence of the Pope. Hey, if you do that, I'll excommunicate you. Who cares, man? Oh no, apathy. My weakness! Henry gathered theologians and scholars together to help him make his case against the Pope. Together, they argued to the people of England that the Pope's rule over the church was basically a takeover of what had once been a self-governing national English church. And if that sounds familiar, some historians do believe this moment may have laid the foundations for English Euroscepticism. That's right, Brexit may have been influenced by Henry's explosive loins. <laughs> well, I agree with the historians actually, but when you think about it, you, you just think about, in a political sense, you think that makes sense, but when you actually think of it twice, you think, that is so disturbing. It really, truly is disturbing. And I, I, I try not to think about it as much as a history nerd, but I, I just think, that that's just really awful but I know with the foundations of Brexit which I won't go into by the way because I'm trying to avoid from politics a lot but when I just like think about it you just think do all politics have to involve like sexy stuff I don't know really the world's just so weird it really truly is weird by and large, the people gave Henry their support, and those that didn't were going to be in for a rough time. But for now, Henry assumed the role of supreme head of the English church, and his next divorce trial was a foregone conclusion. Catherine of Aragon was Aragon, and Anne Boleyn was in. All right, I've upended the entire country to be with you, so you'd better give me a son, okay? Now, did you get my letter about the duckies? Have Can we actually pause for a second to say how pretty the cartoon Anne Boleyn is? I, I don't really know why she's very pretty, but I, I just think with her eyes just like half closed, you just think, wow, she's more prettier than what the portrait represents her in real life because apparently Anne Boleyn wasn't really that pretty but she was very intelligent but when you look at the cartoon it just says things that are whole differently maybe it's through Henry's mind I don't know but that, that's a truly truly interesting portrayal of her having finally married the girl of his dreams it was party time for Henry and what a party Life in the Tudor court was non-stop, huge banquets, with each person eating on average 5,000 calories a day. And no vegetables, those are for poor people. Rich people ate meat. And so you know what else is for rich people? Constipation. But don't let that yeah. stop the party. The toilets are communal, and Henry himself was the center of everything. He ate the best <laughs> food, he had 1,200 pairs of shoes, he didn't even have to wipe his own bum bum. Life was great. Everyone. I give you your majesty, King Henry VIII. <laughs> but how did they pay for it all? Well, influenced by his fairly Protestant new wife, since Henry had overturned the organization of the church, this is how they paid for it. Oh my goodness, how awful. Selling fake fragments of the cross? Vials of Jesus' blood that you got from a duck? Using religion in this way? True sources, actually. Very true. All, all the stuff that was said, that was based on actual documents. <laughs> but what I mean by documents are reports, because the man who plays Cardinal Wolsey was called Thomas Cromwell, and he actually visited lots of abbeys and churches to do some reviews on what the monks are doing and the nuns as well. And based on the interviews, Thomas Cromwell will report them back to the king. And once the king found out what was going on, he ordered the monasteries to be closed or destroyed. And the main reason for this happening was that Henry wanted all the money to be put into the royal coffers. Awful. I must take all of this away. 
immediately. Monasteries <laughs> across the nation were dissolved and their riches placed in the royal coffers. Obviously, many people weren't too happy about this, but Henry had a plan for that as well. Henry's descent into tyranny had begun, as any who rejected his new claim as supreme head of the English church found their heads on the chopping block. And so Henry partied. He danced. He sang. He ate. He jousted. Ooh! Be me. Love gluttony. Violate widows! <laughs> the video will explain a little bit about it, but apparently during that time Henry had a very serious fall which showed in the cartoon and he was unconscious for about two hours, but that was when his whole personality changed, but the video will explain about it just right now actually. Six, Henry fell from his horse in a jousting accident, not for the first time, but certainly the heaviest fall he had mm -hmm. taken yet. Some historians believe the brain damage caused by the incident may have violently accelerated Henry's descent into tyranny. Executions in England ramped up. During his reign, it's estimated 57 to 72,000 people were put Still to death. Still shocks me, really. Rich or poor, big or small, no one was safe. And the most prominent victim of all was to be Henry's own wife. It had been three years since their marriage. Anne had been pregnant four times, yet she had only been able to produce one healthy child, a girl. What's more, it's possible she had been going around insulting Henry's manhood. Henry's eyes once began, to again, wander. began to wander. His new top man, Thomas Cromwell, didn't want to end up like Cardinal Wolsey, and so he came up with a plan. There was a court musician who had been quite flirtatious in public with the Queen. Well, Thomas Cromwell and his boys got a forced confession out of him, saying that it didn't stop at innocent flirtation, and the charges came rolling in. Listen, Anne. We need oh no! Oh, That's no. forced me, aren't you? Force me, aren't Just like you? your last Just wife! Like your last wife? Oh, n no. Come here. Shh. No. I'm not gonna divorce you. It's much worse than it's that. It's much worse than that. Anne was charged with adultery, perversion, even incest, and plotting to kill the king himself. The jury found her guilty, including her own uncle and ex fiance, both fearing the wrath of the king. And on May 19th, 1536, Anne Boleyn was Anne Bullout. Literally the next day, Henry married one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, his third wife. After Anne had smack-talked his manhood, and since he still had no male heir, Henry went on a campaign to ensure the public knew he was as virile as it gets. He had this famous portrait painted of the manliest man I've ever seen, and later, he would even have his physician make a declaration about his health. King Henry is a fine specimen of a man, and- Please don't make me say this. Please don't make me say this. Say it. <laughs> <sighs> and every time I look at him, I wish I was a woman. <laughs> the truth is, after his jousting accident, the king had badly injured his leg and was no longer very active. Yet he was still eating his daily 5,000 calories. <laughs> so by I didn't realize this, but I just saw the banqueting table in the last clip. And I found there was a pizza in there. <laughs> and I don't really know how that pizza got in there. But I, I think, to be honest though, Pizza wasn't really invented in the Tudor period, but I don't really know how it actually got there. And it still puzzles me, and I I just don't know how it got there, really. I, I've got nothing to say on it, just because I'm just shocked. <laughs> Henry was extremely unhealthy. For the remainder of his life, he would incur a number of illnesses, and his injured leg ulcers would ooze. Uh. A fine specimen of a man, indeed. On the church front, Henry's new and now pregnant wife was a devout Catholic, mm -hmm. and she pleaded with the king to reinstate the monastery. Well, I'll have to pause right there with the religious side, because apparently, out of all of his six wives, only two of them weren't Catholic, and they were Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr. And I was a little bit of a surprise, because I thought only three of them were Catholic, but it turns out that despite being in a Lutheran country, Anne of Cleves was actually a Catholic, and she was brought up believing in the Catholic religion because of her mother, and it's something that never really occurred to me in my mind, and you just tend to think, imagine all the ding-dongs that he Henry and his wives actually got into when it comes to religion. I know with Anne and Jane that was a massive case and Catherine Parr as well but I didn't really know with the other three but it just still is a mystery really to me I, I just think anyway. 
Henry was sick of wives meddling in his business, and he bluntly warned her to remember what happened to Anne Boleyn. Since splitting with the Pope, Henry had been hard at work determining the theology of his new Church of England. It kept many Catholic traditions, while on the other hand embracing some reformist ideas, such as requiring the use of a new Bible not in Latin, but in English. The cover of Henry's new Bible depicted the people appearing to worship a giant King Henry. And in the corner, there's some people being put to death, just for good measure. For any who opposed Henry's ideas, whether Catholic or Protestant, for any who rebelled against him, it would be off with their heads. Mm -hmm. In October 1537, Henry finally got what he had been waiting for. His wife Jane gave birth to a healthy boy. However, the triumph soon turned to tragedy as Jane Seymour died days later from complications during the birth. Henry mourned Jane, the woman who had given him a son for two years. Your Majesty, it's time to choose your next wife. Thomas, not now. Can't you see I'm in mourning? <laughs> the woman Thomas Cromwell had lined up for Henry's next marriage was the sister of a powerful German duke. But all Henry cared about was that she was pretty as pie. And Thomas Cromwell promised that indeed she was. However, when she arrived in England, Henry was less than pleased. Your Majesty, let me introduce you to your fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Wh what's that smell? Uh, I think it's your leg, sire. No, it's Anne of Cleves. She's ugly. This is treason. What? Off with his head. Yeah. Henry found his new wife so repulsive that he never consummated the marriage and divorced her just six months later. <laughs> and for bringing Henry an ugly, stinky woman, along with additional charges of plotting treason, Thomas Cromwell lost his head. The very same day of Cromwell's execution, Henry married his... Well... Um, I'll try to speak louder because um, there's some noises of the vacuum going on downstairs, so I do apologise for that. But um, when I was thinking about it before I watched the video, on the same day where Thomas Cromwell was executed and Henry married Catherine Howard, I tend to think that looking back on it when Catherine Howard was executed, I wonder if that some people believed that was a bad omen and I didn't really know if it was the case or not but I can imagine that some people might think on this but I feel so sorry for poor Catherine because she was only young and there were some bits that that should, um, put her into like really difficult positions because people were very obsessed with her because she was a woman and she was very attractive and unfortunately because of those past experiences before she married the king that put her in a whole lot of danger and since she was blackmailed during the time she was queen there was a chance really she was going to get caught which did happen and unfortunately she lost her life because of it and it, it, it's just like a heartbreaking story really I, I, I just feel so sorry and so bad for her really with wife the famed beauty Catherine Howard she's believed to have only been 17 at the time Henry was 40 and like Anne of Cleves Catherine Howard didn't last long you see, for some reason, she may not have been entirely satisfied with her 49-year-old fine specimen of a and it's possible she engaged in a number of extramarital affairs, including one with her cousin, Thomas Culpepper. When Henry found out, he was devastated. How could she do this to me? But, sire, don't you have hundreds of mistresses? Shut up, Barry. That's not the point. He actually did cry <laughs> when he found out Catherine crying. betrayed her. I'm not crying. It's just that sometimes, when I get sad, water... <laughs> For her treason, Catherine Howard met the same fate as Anne Boleyn in 1542. So, we've had divorced, beheaded, divorced, died, beheaded. divorced beheaded, look out, here Look comes out, here comes survive. Henry married the daughter of a royal official, Catherine Parr, in 1543, and she appears to have been a good companion to Henry. She cared for the aging king, who by now was so heavy it took several men to winch him onto his horse. She acted as a mediator within the family and convinced the king to restore his two daughters to the line of succession. Their marriage did have one hiccup, however, when Catherine dared disagree with the king over the subject of theology. It's a miracle because when the priest says the words of institution, the bread turns into the body of Christ. Well, if you put the bread in a box for three months, is it a miracle that it turns moldy? <gasps> Treason! You just can't you call can't it just call treason, treason, Harry! Henry. The king called for her arrest as serious charges were placed over her head. However, in the end, she told Henry that she had not been disagreeing with him, but simply learning mm -hmm. from him. And so when the guards came to arrest her, the king told them to make like an M. <laughs> Catherine Parr stayed with Henry right until the end. As he aged into his later years, in increasing pain and ill health, he grew ever more suspicious and moody. The once generous, promising young king was now feared by all around him. 
two hours later. Well, I had to stop recording in the middle because the vacuuming got really, really loud and I know that it was going to be a bit of a struggle just to carry on talking while it was happening. So I had to stop, but I've got up to the place where I talked last. So I'm going to continue with it and then um, I've only got about two minutes until the video ends really so I'm going to do that and then I'm going to do a quick conclusion before, editing, before ending the video. Why did I say editing? <laughs> Silly me. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Hold me. Of course, sire. Do you have any final wishes? Uh, how, uh, how about... How about one last conquest in France? And so in 1544, Henry made for Calais. The pesky French had been supporting the Scottish in their ongoing wars with England, and they also owed Henry some money. So the extremely unhealthy king personally led a siege against the French city of Boulogne. The English dug tunnels under the castle, and on the 13th of September, the French surrendered. A glorious victory for Henry. In actuality, the whole misadventure nearly bankrupt England, and they ended up giving Boulogne back to the French a few years later. But shh, don't tell Henry. He's having his moment. Finally, in 1547, a 55-year-old Henry, lapsing in and out of consciousness, passed away. His son, Edward, succeeded him, but died just five years later. His daughter, Mary, briefly took the reins and steered the country back towards the Pope. But then his second daughter embraced reformist ideas and gradually transformed England into a Protestant country. Henry's desperation to marry Anne Boleyn and his resulting feud with the Pope had changed the course of English history and religion forever. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, none of Henry's children had heirs, and when Elizabeth I died, Henry's lineage ended, with the House of Stuart replacing the House of Tudor. So then you might think, all that effort, a life filled with so much frustration, yet he never conquered France, he barely had a male heir, and his lineage died out. The egotistical man Henry grew sick and cruel, and then died. Mm -hmm. So why are we all so fascinated yeah. with King Henry VIII? Why not Henry II or IV? Well, without mentioning the many important things his reign did achieve, one of his biggest goals was to go down in history. And you can put a big green check beside that one. Because everything he did and how he asserted his control and authority over everyone mm -hmm. around him has come to be viewed as the, all for the wrong reasons of the word king. And also because of the wife killings. Yeah, definitely the wife killings. Wow, that was a really good video. And I know I have watched it before. I think every time I watch this, I just enjoy it so, so much. And as I was watching it over again, I was going to mention it. But since I was going towards the end, I thought I wouldn't. But I was so surprised that the video didn't really, really, really talk about Henry's naval career because Henry's naval career on the seas was just as successful as he was on the battlefield when he won wars. And I was really surprised they didn't really cover it too much, especially with the Mary Rose. But there are there are some bits that were missed anyway so you really can't blame youtubers for that anyway but then yes i think that's all i have to say on this one this is a side of me you've never actually got to see but now i showed you my side whilst reviewing and talking about this video there's a whole different side of me that i really hid it but i wanted to show it through a youtube video and i know there might be times where i won't do these kind of videos anymore but i just wanted to show what i really love doing in my spare time and how much history as a hobby is very important to me in my life. I'm going to be drawing this video to a close right here. I have asked these two questions at the beginning of the video but also I'm going to actually add a third one and the third question is that if you had to choose a video to review which video would you choose and why and again let me know in the comment section down below and until then guys I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and as always remember to keep on dreaming and to never stop believing. Stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you very soon. Bye!